Our message today entitled, A True Independence Day. A True Independence Day. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 36. And Jesus says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity we have that we can come to your house. We can worship you. I pray right now, Lord, you help us look. As we celebrate this nation's Independence Day, as we did the other day, Lord, I pray that we would understand that there's more to independence than just voting rights. Lord, that we have independence through you that far exceed anything that a nation could provide its citizens. Again, we thank you, Lord, for all you do for us. Help me, Lord, to say the words you would have me say. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You know, 248 years ago, only two more years away from the 250th anniversary, uh, or anniversary, would it be anniversary? Okay. Anniversary of the, uh, the signing of declarations. A group of British colonists. Now, there was a lot of different colonists in the U.S. by that time. You know, German and French and, and you know, Italian and whoever that was in the country. Swedes, there was a lot of different people. But there was a group of British colonists that were up in New England that got frustrated about uh, uh, some unfair taxes. And as a result of that, they, they were upset because they were complaining about these taxes, but it appeared it was going on deaf ears. The kingdom didn't, didn't care less what they had to say. And so as a result of that, it led to a revolution. And on July 4th, 1776, the Continental Congress declared independence from England. Now, that did not make us a free nation. Well, it did and it did not. The war had just begun. So from 1776 until 1783, we're, we're talking, uh, that would be a grand total, my math is correct, of about, uh, let's see, seven years. So seven years of hard-fought battle, this young nation fought this war against the most powerful forces the world had ever seen to this point. The British dominated the world. Most strongest navy, most strongest military, they were the force to reckon with. They were the America of their day. Okay? They were of their America of their day, of the U.S. of their day. But you know, God was in control. We were talking about this morning in Sunday school. How God is in control. And God is in control. Well, there's nothing we can do if God is in control. If we trust God in our life as Christians, that God's going to put us where he needs to put us, and we're going to do, it doesn't matter what others think. It doesn't matter what others do. If God is in control of your life, he will put you where he wants you to be, and there's nothing anybody else can do about it. Now, you can always say no. You understand? There's nothing others can do about it. But here we are, the war, the, the great nation, God had a plan so what he did was he allowed, he got Spain and France involved in this war to help support this new colony because they knew that a weaker British, if the British nation included the American colonies, oh my goodness, we're in trouble. So they got involved to help out this new nation form and they helped fight the British Empire. It is estimated that nearly 70 thousand Americans lost their lives in the Revolutionary War. Seventy thousand. Do you ever mean, I don't didn't know if I knew that number. That's a large number, isn't it? Seventy thousand Americans died, colonists died trying to get freedom for America. The freedom that we celebrate today. Now this was not a nation of millions of people back then. You understand? This was a nation of hundreds of thousands but not millions and millions of people. So a large number of percentage died in the war trying to fight for freedom. Now, just as... Um, I see a problem I got. That's okay. In 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed and England granted independence to the United States. 
But in 1812, there was a war between America and Britain. The difference was the War of 1812 did not have any land fighting. It was all ocean battles. It was about really, it was about taxing and about uh, preventing the, the British from getting, I mean, the French from getting uh, uh, equipment from America. And then the, the French was upset with America because the Britons were getting stuff from America. So it was one of those, it was a... Um, it was one of those ocean type situations. It was uh, tariffs and things of that nature. They did not come and fight on American soil. There were still Americans killed during that war because they fought you know, sea battles. And again, Britain is the strongest Navy. So it was, a, it was a factor. Independence is such a powerful concept. Independence. America boasts itself on being independent. I'm grateful, aren't you, that we live in this great nation? Regardless of all of our problems, and we got problems. We got problems in the fact that America's turning its back on God. That's a message for another day. But we know that we see it on the news. Just turn on the news. Just go through towns. Look at your local news. See America's turning on America is turning its back on God. Seems like the only way to attract people into town these days is by having by by legalizing vice, you know, a social districting and uh, and uh, and adult things and all these things you got to put in there so that they can attract people into town. See, that's not God's way; that's man's way. The First Amendment to the Constitution protected freedom to worship God. The number one thing this new nation said we got to do is protect people from the right to worship God. Why? Because they formed this nation based upon the desire to worship God the way they wanted to worship God, which was, by the way, the right way. They had seen all the corruption that had gone through all the different fake religions of their day, including those that had established themselves with the Catholicism and the Church of England, and therefore they came, most of them sacrificing, a lot of them dying on the way over, just so we can have freedom. So the first amendment to the Constitution was that of freedom of religion. And it said this, Congress shall make no laws respecting any establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a red redress of grievances. I said, we have certain rights as Americans, and one of those rights is the right to worship as we please. That is under attack today. This mess is not going where I want it to go. I'm just telling you, the Lord lead me down that road, but I'm going to give it to you when he gives it to me. The point is, God is in control, but we, are, we as Christians have to be on the guard. So as we remember and celebrate the great freedoms that we enjoy in our country. We need to focus more on the ultimate freedom that we have. The ultimate freedom that we have as Christians is only found through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate freedom of mankind. So how is freedom defined in the Bible? We read that verse. John chapter 8 verse 36. If the Son shall, set, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. The only people who are truly free are those who are free in the Son. That's what the Bible says. True freedom can only be found in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has always been God's answer to our loss of freedom. When Jesus began his ministry, you may remember he used a passage from Isaiah... And he, he used the passage of Isaiah, but he, he told the passage in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. He said, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, 
and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it again to the minister, sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He said, I came to provide liberty. Liberty to you. Liberty to them that are bruised. Liberty to them that have been, been beat up by sin in their lives. The last verse he tells us in Scripture that is being fulfilled through him. See, he says he is the Messiah that the people were waiting for. He provides a way to free all humanity, mankind, from the bondage of sin. He's the manifestation of freedom. He is, if we're thinking of freedom, we should think of Jesus. And what Jesus did for us on the cross, that's freedom. Our stuff is just temporary freedom. Because guess what? You don't have total freedom in America. Do you? You don't. Drive 100 miles an hour down 95 for a while. Well, it might take a while because a lot of people drive 100 miles down an hour. But let's say, let's say there's a policeman out there watching. You don't have the freedom to do that, do you? You don't have the freedom. Somebody goes, if you want something your neighbor's got, you can't get up and pick it up and take it home, would you? Some people do, but they can't get supposed to. That ain't free. See, you can't, you're not free to do everything you want to do. You're not free to do everything. True freedom comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's true freedom. We have the freedom to worship God. We have the freedom to serve God. We have the freedom from sin in our lives. Because guess what? I can, I can steal all I want to steal. I don't want to steal. <laughs> Isn't it right? I can get drunk all I want to get drunk. I don't want to get drunk. I have the freedom. The alcoholic doesn't have a freedom, do they? Alcoholics committed. We're talking about drugs today. Everybody today is committed. We know people who are addicted to drugs. Don't we? All of us know somebody. They don't have freedom. They're enslaved. Sin enslaves people. Everyone in prison today are in prison. Well, all the guilty people. There's innocent people there too. I'll marry you nice. There are some people there that are in bad situations. They're not, they didn't do it, but they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They got charged with something they shouldn't have got charged with, but they're, they're the minority, okay? Most people in prison, they're there because they're guilty of something. They're enslaved by sin, and that's why they're there. These prisons are full of sinners, but so are churches, <laughs> aren't we? We're full of sinners. We're enslaved by sin. And the only way we can break that bond of sin, to, sin is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Without accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we cannot have freedom. Without Jesus, we will always experience chaos, disorder, injustice. True freedom as defined by the Bible can only be found in Jesus. That's what he said. We need to seek Jesus to experience freedom from the chaos of this world and from the things that keep us away from God. So today, I want us to look at five freedoms that God gives us in Scripture. Five freedoms he gives us in Scripture. The first one is he gives us freedom from death. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The first freedom he gives us is the freedom from death. The reason why Jesus died on the cross was so that all humanity would be free from sin and be allowed to gain eternal life. The first freedom. This is how much God loved us. That he was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son. To save you from your sins. And to give you eternal life. He could not have it. There had to be a way to get you and God together. And that can only happen if you were sinless. And the only way you can be sinless. Is if somebody paid the price for that sin. Remember, we've been studying Ephesians. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 1 and 2, and we know God's planned that one from the beginning. It wasn't a surprise. God planned from the very beginning forever built the world that sacrificed His Son for mankind. The sacrifice, by the way, is called the good news. Not just some mere good news, the best news ever, isn't it? Isn't that the best news it's the good news. How many of you like sharing good news? I love telling people, I got some good news and bad news. What you want to hear? 
I always say, let me hear the bad news first. Why? Because I'd rather, I want to leave me with the good news. <laughs> if you tell me the good news, I'm not going to worry about the good news. I'm going to be thinking about what is the bad news then, right? <laughs> Aren't you? Man, what's the bad news? If you tell me good news, give me the bad news first. Give me the bad news. I want to know what it is. I hope the good news overrides the bad. <laughs> you know? Give me my dessert first. Right? So uh, anyway, having the best news ever. Having, having, by having faith in our Lord Jesus, we are free from death. The death that we deserve, by the way, of eternal damnation. The death that we deserve, but we are freed. We're free from punishment of those evil things that we have thought and that we have done. Remember, our sin consists not only of our, not only of our actions, but our thinking. Jesus said, you know, you don't, don't tell me about adultery. Tell me about lust. Because you don't commit adultery until you lust. Right? Don't, don't tell me about murder. You hate before you murder. See, the problem is coming from inside. The action is what happens outside. Right? It's the outward action. That's affected because of the inward action. Love is something you do internally and then you demonstrate that love outwardly. See, sin inside can cause problems. We aren't only free, we aren't only free, but we also depend all of our eternity with God and his people because of what Jesus did on the cross. So we've seen the freedom from death. Let's look at the second thing now, freedom from sin. John chapter 8, verse 34 to 36. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth a sin is the servant of sin. Say it again. Whoever committeth a sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Notice that's the last part of our study that we opened up with. See, after we accept Jesus, Satan is not going to stop trying to attack you, is he? He's going to continue to try to attack you. He's still going to try to use his efforts to tear us away from God. He will do more to bring you back. He, he, he wants to do, he'll do more as a, as a Christian. Satan will use his power even more so for you to come back to him. If there's a way to entice you, he'll be enticing you. If you allow a crack in your, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a, I, I have a degree in electronics. One of my degrees in electronics. I work with voltage. You know, I don't care for much more than 12 volts, but I can do it. But you know what? I mean, I'm like, kind of, I mean, I ain't, I ain't climbing on a pole, man. I'm not gonna do it. I, I have too much respect for it, but I respect for you willing to do it, man. I appreciate you, but it ain't gonna be me. <laughs> Uh, but I can understand electricity. I can understand connections make it flow. I can understand you have uh, the you have uh, the uh, you have uh, 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 different types of, of uh, signals that are you have electromagnetic flux that goes around the wires that can cause noise and things of that nature. I understand those things, but I'm not much of a plumber. Man, plumbing to me water. I hate water. You know what? You know what? I can have a I can have a couple strings on the wire. And put some of the little things on it, and it'll work. But man, plumbing, man, I got to seal it up over and over again because it might have pressure and it might blow out the seal I put in it. <laughs> I think I got it. Nope, didn't get it. You know? And guess what? You'll find that out quickly. Actually, you find it using the hard way. What's that water running on my floor? I hate working with plumbing. But you know what? That's kind of the way it is with our sin life as a Christian. We think we got, we're plumbers here, right? We think we got it under control. But we're shade tree plumbers at best, right? We put that putty around it or the, 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 the plumber's tape around it thinking we got it. But see, we're not the expert plumber. Satan knows how to go and attack those weak joints. If you have a weakness at all, he will find it. If you have a weakness, you need to ask God to help you with the weakness because he will find your weakness. Whatever it is, he's got it. 
And as a Christian, he's going to even target it more. A lot of people say, you know, the lost people, Satan is doing all these things to lost people. No, he's not. No, he's not. Satan doesn't have to work with lost people at all. Because they're already lost. Their nature is evil. They don't need Satan to lead them astray. They're already astray. He don't need to spend any of his effort on them. He can use them to help attack things that God's trying to do that we see politicians are doing today. We see politicians that are used by Satan, don't we? Sure we do. Because it ain't a God, it's a Satan. And we see that happening. But we see here that uh, the Christians, Christians, Satan is going to continue to attack us. Christians should understand that Satan will not rest until he can separate you from God. He will do everything he can. Don't give him a crack in your putty. If you do, there's going to be a string before you know it. And guess what? You can't hide that string but so long. That water will eventually show damage on something around it, won't it? Same as sin. Sin's going to call. You may let that sin. They say, it's just a drip. It's just a drip. Okay, I'm not quite sealed it up. Just a drip. I don't want to crank it up any tighter than that. Just a drip. Over time, that drip will rot the wood, rust the joints, cause far more damage than you can think. But it was just a drip. Isn't that way it is with sin? It's just, just a small sin. It's not a big one. It's just a little thing. Drip, drip, drip. Satan is a master plumber. He knows how to cause problems in those seals. That's why it's important always to choose God over everything else. While we still battle sin, we are no longer slaves to it. As Christians, we're no longer a slave to sin. If you're allowing Satan, see, you have to allow Satan to control your life as a Christian because you have the power to re repel him. It's a Johnson County, but sometimes those things don't want to come out. <laughs> you have the ability to repel him through the Holy Spirit. You can lean upon him when you're weak, he is strong. You know what song? We can lean on him when we're weak. Don't rely upon yourself. But the deal is we're no longer slaves to sin. If you're a Christian today, you're no longer a slave to sin. You hear me? You're no longer a slave to sin. You have freedom from sin. You say, but we still sin. Yes, we do. Why? Because we're weak. That's what Paul said. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Help my spirit. Help my unbelief. Help me really, let me lean on him. Let me, let me lean into him. Let him take over. Carrie Underwill's song, Lord, take the wheel. I can't do it anymore, but you can. Let him take control. Don't you think, don't, don't become a slave. You're not a slave to sin anymore. Because the power of Jesus in our lives, we don't have to worry about that. Through Jesus, we can free, be free from vanity, from pride, from greed, from addiction, from pornography, from gluttony. Oh, oh I'll pass out on that one. Uh, Self-selfishness. <laughs> Any other sin. See, through Jesus, we've seen that we are free from death and sin. We're, and through Jesus, we also have the freedom to choose our paths. We have the freedom to choose our paths. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherein, wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. See, when God created man, he did not create him to be a robot. He created man with the ability to make choices. I'll give you an example. The first choice he gave him was what? You know what the first choice he gave him was? He gave him the ability to name the animals. Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. Out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. See, the first thing God did when he created man was gave him choices. 
He gave him choices. This proves that God's creation has free will. From the very beginning, we have free will because Adam could have called them whatever he wanted to. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. See, he gives you choices. He gives all of us choices to live or to die. To serve or to reject. To be saved or to be lost. We can choose to accept the true freedom he offers through Jesus. We have the free will to accept or reject the salvation found in Jesus. Look, John, 1 John, John, well, John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. See, God gave us the ability. He gives us the ability to serve Him. The ability to be, as I told you before, unless the Holy Spirit called you, you can never be saved. You can't be, right? I mean, we, no one, the Bible tells us, no one seeks after God. No, not one. We're all in our own way. But the Holy Spirit enables us to choose gives us the ability to choose right from wrong, to choose to serve or reject. And once the Holy Spirit comes in your life, you're no longer a slave. Mind you, the Bible has a strong warning against those who choose poorly. People wind up where they reject the truth. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 says, But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. See, there's a choice. The choice to choose God and live and the choice to reject God and die. But we make choices. But see, God has given us the freedom to choose. That's a great freedom the Bible tells us, isn't it? The freedom to choose. John 3, 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He not only provides us eternal life when this life is over, but He works out in our lives today. He doesn't just give us eternal life. He gives us hope even now. He says, Romans 8, 28, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Now, I want to tell you something about this verse. Says this verse must have misunderstood. It does not mean as a Christian your life is going to be good. <laughs> That's not what it means. It says all things work out for good. What good? For the good of God, for the good of the cause, for the good of Christ. Many missionaries have gone to foreign countries and been murdered and martyred. There's Christians today being martyred in all kinds of places in Africa and Korea and Asia and even in America. There are people being killed because of their faith. That's not good, is it? It is good because it's God's will for their lives because through that death, God can have good come out of it. God can, give, uh, God can make people see that people give their life for Christ. If you're willing to die for your cause, that means you truly believe. It's not something you wonder about. It's not a fake thing. It's not something you say to make other people impressed by you. It's if you're giving your life for the cause. He says all things, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. God will give you, will use you in a way that your life is worth something. Isn't that what we all want? In the end, don't we want our life to be worth something? Don't we just live our lives and it's really worth nothing? Have you known people who live their lives and really they got nothing to say for it when it's all said and done? I've seen rich people. We've seen, I've seen, I've read obituaries of or last words of famous rich people. And all they have at the end of their life is regrets. Regrets. They know, they fear the awesome death coming upon them because they've rejected God and their lives and they've wasted their time on this earth. Their life is full of regrets. 
But see, God tells us as Christians, our path is full of good. That all things work together for good in our lives. That we'll serve a purpose in life. In return, we should devote our lives to honoring Him. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whether you therefore eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever we do, we should be doing it to the glory of God. If you can't do it for the glory of God, then don't do it. You say, well, hold on, eating pancakes, is that for the glory of God? you got to have nutrient. Nu- nu- Thank you. One of my words, some people have words they can't say, that's one of mine. Nutrients. Uh, you need those things in your body so you can do things. So yeah, eating pancakes is good for you. Sometimes it's too good for me, but you know what I mean. I love those pancakes from Waffle, from uh, Cracker Barrel. Oh my goodness. Mama's pancake breakfast. Ain't it good? Oh, no, <laughs> it's not even that. Okay. <laughs> um, we, so we've seen that through Jesus we have freedom of death and from sin. We have freedom to choose our past. We have freedom to proclaim the gospel. I mean, we have freedom to repent. Now we also have the freedom to proclaim the gospel. That's the other freedom. God gives us the freedom to proclaim the gospel. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recover of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. See, Jesus has freed us. And just like Paul, he freed him from the bondage of sin through the sacrifice on the cross. As a result, we have freedom to proclaim and spread the gospel. Only we who have experienced that can really tell people about it. We have that freedom to share the truth with others. What a great thing to share. So let me see. I can share my financial advice and help people make more money. I can share my uh, psychological device, I mean, advice as a, as a counselor to help people with their social interactions. Okay? I can help people in sports by being a coach, help them develop their skills. I can teach people as a drone operator, so I teach drones, I'm, I can teach drone operators, get them certified so they can make money as a drone operator. I can do all those things, right? But in the end, they die and go to hell. What a waste of time. What a waste of time. If we don't share the gospel with other people, everything else we share with them has been a big waste of time. You understand? We've taken away from them their opportunities for eternal life because we spend the time talking about something else that really means nothing. Nothing. Because without Jesus in their lives, there is nothing but an awesome, fearful waiting for the judgment. Now, there's nothing wrong with teaching sports or teaching financials or teaching anything else. But if we don't spend the time sharing the gospel, which is one of the freedoms we have according to the scriptures, then we don't do them any justice. We've wasted their time, valuable time. As I get older, I can almost hear each grain at the bottom of the glass. Can you? As you get older, those of us that are getting older, almost can hear the drains of sand in the bottom of that time, the hourglass. It seems it goes by so fast. So fast. What have we done with our lives? What have we done with our lives? We have the freedom to share it with other people. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? Jesus passing through Jericho. Zacchaeus being the chief political leader of the town, but he's a short guy. I mean, he's a short dude, like a midget or something. Okay, he was a short guy. And uh, you remember the song. Zacchaeus was up in the tree, and the, the song, you know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree, the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, you come down because I'm going to your house today. Because I'm going to your house today. Did you hear that song? We sing that song with our children. We should still be singing that song with our children, by the way. 
You know, I, I, I sit in churches that have this modern music today and they teach them songs that I can't sing as an adult. I'm thinking, where's Zacchaeus? <laughs> you know, where's the simple songs that I can remember as an adult? I can't remember those songs as, a, as an adult. Um, the 11 verses with different things. I don't want to go down that road. But see, Zac Jesus did not save Zacchaeus alone. He declared that he was going to his household. See, Jesus was there to save not just Zacchaeus, but to save Zacchaeus' family. Because it was more important, not just Zacchaeus. You know, we always say this. I, would, I, I think about this. If I made it to heaven and the rest of my family did not, what a failure I was. Don't you agree? Now, if I've struggled the best I could, but remember, let me tell you, the caveat to that, if you've done everything you can, in the end, it's their choice, not yours. In the end, it's their choice. But see, in heaven, if you've done all you can do, then you'll be at, you'll be at peace because you did all you can do. Remember, you're responsible for the effort, not the response. He declares salvation has come to this house, entire household. Luke 9, he said, Jesus said to him, This day is salvation come to this house for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. See, Jesus followed that statement up in verse 10 by saying, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. We experience God's freedom by accepting Jesus and we should continue spreading the gospel to our friends, to our families, to our communities, to our cities, to our nation, and to those who who don't know Jesus. That's what we should be doing. We're called to be God's representatives, His channel of salvation as we spread. Remember I told you, we are the Holy Spirit because He lives in us. And we say, man, I wish the Holy Spirit would speak to them. Dude, get off your rear end and go do it then because the Holy Spirit living in you, ain't He? If you speak to them, is the Holy Spirit speaking to them? Sure He is. You are the Holy Spirit. Act like it. He lives in you. Let Him use you for that activity. Okay? You say, well, I'm hoping He, I was kind of hoping he would just get to it. You know? Just while He's sleeping sometime or another. <laughs> Wake up. Hey, the Holy Spirit talked to me last night. Can it happen? Sure it can, but sure but a whole lot easier if you put, it, if you put a word in for Him. I got a friend I need to introduce you to. We've seen Jesus. Through Jesus we have the freedom from death, from sin, the freedom to choose our paths, the freedom to proclaim the gospel. And finally, we'll look at the freedom to enjoy life in Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin <clears throat> and of death. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 97 verse 10 says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He pers he pers he pers I'll get it right. He preserveth the soul of his saints. He delivers them out of the hands of the wicked. That's a promise from God the Father. As we live for Christ... God assures that, that He will always protect us no matter what our circumstances are in. This is the assurance that His faithful who continue to live under God's grace will be protected. We as God's children, we aren't bound by the laws of sin and death, but we're bound by the laws of grace and mercy. You know, when I sin and I sin like the rest of you sin, for me to say I was not a sinner, to me to say that I don't commit sins would be proclaiming I'm better than Paul. You know what, though, but when I sin, I feel guilty of my sin. Do you? Holy Spirit convicts me of my sin, and you know what? That old devil behind you say, yep, you ought to be embarrassed by that, man. You ought not just, you know, how dare you? How dare you? You know what I say? And then the Holy Spirit reminds me, David, you know what? You got this message you got to prepare and I've got to help you prepare it so you need to get that out of your life. Ask forgiveness for it. Move on, son. 
ask forgiveness and move on because God promised us if we ask forgiveness, he'll forgive us of all unrighteousness, right? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As a Christian, we can say, God, forgive me of my sins, and he will every single time. Every single time, every single time. Say, man, I've asked so many times, I'm embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed every single time. Satan wants you to be embarrassed. Satan wants you to think that you can't do it. You can every single time, no matter how many times. How many times do we forgive him, Lord? How many times do we go to our neighbor? Seven times? Jesus says 77 times seven. It don't matter. And I'm an infinite number. Just keep doing it. Don't let Satan you out as the song would go. Keep serving God. Keep asking forgiveness. We have that ability to live for Christ. We can. Don't let Satan hinder you. Ask forgiveness for it. Get it out of your life. Don't let it hinder you. Don't linger on it. Immediately, when the Holy Spirit convicts you of that sin, say, Lord, forgive me for my sins. I'm leaning on the name of Jesus, and he will forgive you automatically. Now, you may have guilt that you can't get over yourself immediately because you feel like you let him down. And you did. But you know what? God don't want us living and wallowing in that. He wants us moving forward. If he's forgiven us, shouldn't we forgive ourselves and keep moving? We should continue to live our lives to the fullest by putting God first in our lives. So as we celebrate this 4th of July holiday, let us remember... That true freedom is not found in a nation, but found in a Savior. Jesus freed us from sin, from bondage, from death, from all evil things. He preserves us to praise and honor during, the, during these uh, days that we have. As we celebrate this country's Independence Day, let the name of Lord Jesus be spread among all the nations. Let's tell them about the true Independence Day. My Independence Day occurred when I was 10 years old and I came to an altar and I asked Jesus to save me. That's when my Independence Day began. You understand? If you today have never experienced an Independence Day, if you've never come to the altar and asked Jesus to save you, you don't know what I'm talking about. You're still living as a slave working for the taskmaster who don't care for you very much. But you can come to the altar today and the Holy Spirit can work in your life today and can change you from what you were to what you are. Because you know what, what you were? is the same thing we are. Because we're all filthy rags. None of us in here are better than others. So don't be embarrassed by coming to the altar to ask Jesus to save you because all of us have done it. And we're all filthy sinners needing saving, needing forgiving every day. So we're no better than anybody. And guess what? We would, the heavens, the Bible tells us that the heavens and angels, the heavens, angels, heavens and angels, the angels in heaven rejoice when one person gets saved. The altars are open today for that. You can spend, you can celebrate during this Independence Day, true independence. True freedom is found in Jesus, and only through him can you experience that freedom. Why not make Independence Day mean more than just freedom that we celebrate as a nation and make it the freedom that we celebrate with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity. I pray, Lord, now if there's someone here that's not saved, that today they would experience that independence by coming forward and asking Jesus to save them. Lord, you can do it today. I pray, Lord, if there's people here today that are saved but are, are living in that shadow where they don't... Feel their freedom. They've allowed Satan to, to cloud their eyes. Lord, we know you will forgive them immediately if they ask. Lord, I pray if they need to come to the altar today, Lord, I pray you would give them that strength to do so also. Lord, we thank you for your son. We thank you, Lord, for all he did for us and do, does for us every day. I thank you, Lord, for the freedom we have through him and through your grace. For in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you're saved today and you need to pray, maybe you need to pray for somebody. Maybe you have somebody on your heart that is not right with God 
You want them to experience true independence. Come here to all and pray for them. I'll pray with you. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I shall be in the midst. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The prayer of a bunch of righteous men availeth much more. I've added that, but I think that's valid. If you're not saved today, why not today? Chris, 